Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Karis and team, for, for leading us in worship. Nobody throws down a whoa like Karis Haynes. That, that was like my single famous favorite moment in, in the whole set. Uh, that, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, hey, it was, it was one year ago exactly today when I was posed a question Uh, One of the most provocative, pointed, loaded questions that I've been asked in a long, long time. Now, the question came on the heels of the memorial service for Paul Truax. Paul passed away a year ago on Monday. We had a memorial service on April 10th, which was Saturday last year. And, And Paul was a wonderful man. Um, We celebrated so many great things about his life, not least of which was his service to Urban Promise down in Wilmington, and the fact that Paul was actually the catalyst for what is today Willowdale and Espanol. You see, Paul had heard us articulate kind of a dream and a vision that we might be able to connect more uh, with, with our neighbors of different nationalities and ethnicities, particularly the Latino community, because that's who's most around us, We wanted to connect with these folks, but with people from, you know, wherever they're from. And uh, and, and we we just wanted to so much more like reflect uh, the multi-hued kingdom of heaven here on earth if we could. And, and, And Paul knew we didn't want to just do it like by serving out there, which is a wonderful thing to do, but can sometimes be kind of paternalistic. We wanted to gather together and serve the Lord together in here. You know, lock in arms as brothers and sisters, as as co-equals. We wanted to be a more diverse, worshiping, disciple-making community. We want to do this thing called church together. And uh, Paul heard that vision and actually recognized, ooh, I know somebody who might help. You see, it was Paul Truax who met a man down in Delaware at a Bible study named Gustavo Castaneda. And he came and told me one day, you got to meet this guy. I think he could help us with this vision. And uh, you could say the rest is history because Gustavo has been such an integral part of our team now for several years. And, and uh, hey, we, we have a long, long way to go. We have by no means arrived on like sort of the diversity front. But at last count, we had something like 30 different nations represented right here in little old Willowdale Chapel, including at least a dozen from Central and South America. And uh, Gustavo's been such a key part of that whole thing. And, well, we just celebrated Paul Truax making that happen uh, during the open mic time of his memorial service. But then that's what led to the pointed question afterward. Stand right back there in the doorway. And a guest at the service from Massachusetts uh, came up to me and he goes, so is this a woke church? I didn't want to like answer right away without sort of ferreting out a little bit more maybe where he was coming from. So I said like, well, interesting question. Why do you ask? And he says, well, you know, you were talking about like diversity and racial reconciliation, but then you turned around and gave like the most clear, straightforward gospel presentation. And I'm just trying to put it together. Well, we had a good few moments of conversation and I don't know this man's heart. He certainly is articulate on matters of the faith, but I couldn't help but think that maybe there was a gap in his understanding of the gospel. Because as we're going to talk about today, as we continue this teaching series called We Need the Cross, the cross unites us. It reconciles us to God. It unites us with each other. And these things are not poles apart. They're like two sides of the same coin. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, I think describes that two-sided coin better than any other single chapter in the Bible. The first half of Ephesians 2, we'll call it the head side of the coin. It tells us how we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. We were, by our very nature, children of wrath. That's all we deserved from God was wrath for our sin and rebellion. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, made us alive even while we were dead. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hallelujah. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the heads up side of the gospel. But then the second half of Ephesians 2, this is the tails side. And let's just bear in mind as we read it, you don't have legitimate coinage unless you got a heads and a tails, right? Would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word? This is Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him, We both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I'm posed this question. By the way, one other thing about Paul Truax, he was a staunch Republican, politically active and astute. Not only that, but Paul knew Joe Biden. Like, they went to school together. And Paul didn't like Joe Biden very much. But he was a little bit worried that his pastor might vote for him. So one day after church, he came up to me right down here with Deanne and I, and he had this thick folder full of paper, uh, printed out the party platforms of the Republicans and the Democrats, did a little comparative religion with me. And it was just really trying to persuade us to make sure that we would vote with Paul. Now, let me be quick to add, Paul did that with absolute respect. I never had one hint in any of that that like his membership at Willowdale was hanging in the balance or his respect for me as his pastor. I mean, we both knew that a silly little thing like a presidential election couldn't touch our mutual love and loyalty to Jesus. And so Paul was kind of something of an enigma. It was kind of hard to see where he's come from. I mean, for some people, I mean, I think the last thing Paul would have called himself was woke. Yet you could say that he seemed to give himself to all sorts of woke causes. And so I answered my questioners, so is this a woke church? By saying, well, if you call concern for like racial reconciliation or the redress of injustices or, or just harmony and mutual understanding, if you call that woke, All right, I just prefer to call it Christian because that's what our text says it is, right? It's it's just Christian. God has done something that no flag, no creed, no politician, no activist could do. He actually unified us. He reconciled us with the Father. He united us with one another. He actually created this one new entity in which anyone in the world could find grace and peace, the church. I know, sounds crazy. Most churches do not live up to that high calling. We want to grow into it more and more and more. We are God's beloved community. You know, 
Paul passed away on April 4th, the same day as Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke a lot about beloved community. Rather well-known quote of his is that our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. You know, I, I largely agree with MLK there, and, and I affirm the heart of that quote. But I would want to respectfully make one correction. Our job is not to create a beloved community. Our job is to be the beloved community because Jesus has already created it, right? We exist. Look at us. We're all in this room together. He's already created the community. We just want to live in it. We just want to be who we are. We want to let the gospel and the cross of Christ have all its unifying effects. So let's think it through, and let's think it through in concentric squares. I'll explain that a little bit later. At the heart of the matter is our union with Christ, our unity to God. The cross unites us to God. We're united to God. And, and that's, you can't even get on and talk about racial reconciliation or, or just a, a conciliatory spirit between peoples of different parties or whatever until you talk about reconciliation with God. Our text opens by describing five really desperate, wretched conditions that we all find ourselves in before we come to Christ. In particular, we Gentiles. Any Gentiles in the room? Am I the only one? I don't think I'm the only one. Most all of us, right, are, are Gentiles. Here's our plight apart from Christ. It's really the plight of anyone apart from Christ. But in the Old Testament times, if you were a faithful Jew, you could at least say that you were kind of in position A to receive the promised Messiah. You were near, not the Gentiles. They were far. They were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. It doesn't get any more desperate than that. To be Christless, homeless, promiseless, hopeless, godless, that is a sad, sorry situation. And it's kind of crazy making. Now, I was thinking this week of, of the old movie Castaway, right? Remember the old Tom Hanks movie Castaway? I mean, you know, just, just trying to eke out an existence, just trying to survive. Best friends of volleyball. It's pretty bad, right? I, I looked up the movie just to see, like, Googled it, just to see when it was put out. 2000. It was over 20 years ago that Castaway came out. But when I Googled it, the first thing that struck me in, in looking at it is the title of the movie is actually Cast Away. Two words. A castaway, one word, a noun is a person, right? Who's shipwrecked, or in his case, plane wrecked. But cast away, two words, is a verb. Like when you toss something out. And it describes exactly the fate of anyone who doesn't know Christ as their Savior and Lord. They will be cast away into outer darkness. And why? Because in their rebellion and sin, they've already cast God away from themselves. What goes around comes around. That's our situation. But thank God for the gospel, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We've been brought near because Christ came near. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Jesus comes with a message of peace. He comes offering terms of peace. It's always been God's message to us in Christ. I mean, when he was born, the angels, right? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's his birth. On Palm Sunday, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he comes in riding on a donkey. It's a symbol of peace. And then he wept over the city, saying, Oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew this day what would bring you peace. They didn't have a clue. But Jesus knew, and he went through with it anyway. He died on the cross for our sins making peace between us and God. And when he rose on the third day and first met his disciples hiding behind locked doors, what were his first words? Peace be with you. 
which I think in that moment was more than just the common greeting of the day. I think he meant like, no, no, I mean like literally, peace be with you. It's been achieved. It's been accomplished. I have put an end to all the hostilities. Your hostility toward God, his just wrath against you, I finished it all. I fought the war to end all wars. Remember that? The war to end all wars, the war to end war. World War I, right? It actually, a phrase came from a, a booklet published by H.G. Wells. World War I was supposed to be the war to end war. The war to end all wars. We're going to take on these militant nationalistic people. We're going to defeat them once and for all. And then we'll just usher in a golden age of peace. How'd that go? 20 years later, we got a second world war and the bloodiest century in human history, which is pretty much par for the course in any plan of like human-born peacemaking or self-salvation. It does not go very well, but, but Jesus did what none of us could do. He actually fought the war to end all wars in the spiritual realm. On the cross, the world cried, crucify him, crucify him, and Jesus accepted it. And he just drank to the dregs all the toxic, poisonous vitriol of the human heart, our chemical weapon against all things good and holy. Jesus drank it. And on the cross, he absorbed the nuclear fallout of God's wrath, his just sentence against that kind of human sin. Jesus just absorbed it all. And now we're all brought near through the blood of Christ. There's nothing left to do but come into his outstretched arms. We have peace accords in Jesus and they are written in his blood. And then, once you recognize that you have peace with God, that blood-bought peace immediately spills over into our relationships with each other. Let's consider the next layer out. The cross unites us to each other, with each other. Verse 15 describes God's purpose in the cross. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Jesus created one new man. Now, first and foremost, Jesus is that one new man. Before he came to earth, he was just God. When he came to earth, he became the God man. And we can partake of the divine nature in him. We'll study that in 2 Peter right after Easter. Anyone who hitches their wagon to Jesus becomes part of that one new man. We become a, a new humanity, kind of a, a new race. Those who are saved by grace through faith. And consequently, verse 19, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Now you've got a country, now you've got a family, now you have a seat at the table, and this changes everything. This becomes defining of you now. Everything else that you formerly thought was defining of you, central to your identity, that stuff all becomes secondary and peripheral now. I mean like real things. In Galatians 3.28 says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.11 says, Here, in the body of Christ, in the church, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And you could just multiply categories and divisions from there. I mean, in Christ, there's no right or left. There's no black and white. There's no vaxxed and anti. There's no Eastern or Westerner. There's no citizen or dreamer. Christ is all and in all. I mean, you name your category of division and tell me which one Jesus doesn't basically make irrelevant by his cross. We come together in Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that once you become a Christian that somehow you stop being your nationality or your gender or maybe having your political persuasion. It's just that these things stop defining you and they stop dividing us. 
and they stop becoming the criteria by which we extend either love to or maybe shun others, it just has no place anymore because Jesus is our peace and he destroys every barrier of hostility. I mean, how, how could it be any other way? Like, speaking of castaway, think of it like this. Let's say your cruise ship has wrecked and sunk, and now you're floating in the North Atlantic. You're a 1,000 miles from any shore, so you're not swimming to safety. Besides, the sharks are already circling, and the water is very cold. Some people have already succumbed. You're still treading water for your life. And then you see coming toward you a ship, a rescue boat, it's steaming toward the debris field. We're going to be saved. And as they start plucking people out of the waters of death, out of judgment, out of the abyss, and you climb aboard that ship, do you not automatically have a camaraderie and a bond with every other rescued person, not to mention the people on the ship who, who've helped you get there? I mean, you're saved people now. That's all that matters. Back on the cruise ship, you, you might have dined and recreated only with, like, your own kind. That cruise ship had a lot of different people on it, people of different languages, nationalities, races, classes. There were some people who dressed weird. A couple of those people smell like weed. I'm going to steer clear of those. You know, there are going to be a number of people that's like, ooh, I'm, I'm getting away from them. But once you're on the rescue boat, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're all saved now. It's just like all helps and hugs all the way around. Like, hey, how you doing? You need anything? How's your family? Everybody okay? Everybody's crowding into the galley to eat. There's no seats. Like, come on over here. We'll scooch in. Come on in. It's like, we've got a bond now. And, and as you talk around that table and you discover that, hey, there's somebody here who's Chinese, another one who's Chilean. That just multiplies your joy because now, hey, guess what? I got friends in Shanghai and Santiago now. Not just friends, family right? In the body of Christ, we're family. We all have adoption as sons and daughters. We all have access to God the Father. We all partake of one spirit. We all find common ground and common cause at the foot of the cross of Christ. Every dividing wall of hostility is just destroyed. I had a great experience of this just a couple of weeks ago, uh, right back here uh, by, by where the screen is uh, during a men's prayer time. Uh, we are deep into our 30 days of prayer as men. I'm so grateful for the 30 to 50 guys who are participating in this. And uh, we do it mostly on Zoom during the week, but on Saturdays at 8, we gather in person. And uh, just by happenstance, I'm sitting in a circle, and I've got two brothers, one on my right, one on my left, and uh, they could not be more different. Uh, the one guy I know is a, a staunch Republican, very politically active. They're both wonderful Christian men and very astute. The guy on the other side, uh, different race, different nationality, and just put it this way, when Barack Obama got elected, he thought that was one of the greatest things he had ever seen in his life. So these two could not be more different. But you know what? We just sat in that circle and prayed together for half an hour. We just praised God together brought our needs and requests together. We even touched on a couple of like political topics as we're praying for our world. And for 30 minutes, I sensed nothing in that circle but fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was exactly the way it's supposed to be. We live for that kind of unity, for that kind of peaceable spirit between us. There's just nothing better. We don't create that beloved community. It already exists, but like Paul says, we make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We will protect that peace at all costs. An example of this happened in the early church in Antioch. You might know the story of the church at Antioch. It was the first real, like, multicultural church. Antioch was this cosmopolitan city, all sorts of different neighborhoods and ethnic enclaves, but the gospel came to Antioch and now these people from all these different communities start coming together. And in fact, it was the citizens of Antioch who first gave these people the name Christian. It's like, we need a new name, you know, to, to describe this tribe comprised of every tribe. We'll, we'll just call them Christians. They saw it as a pejorative term. We revel in it. 
But, but here's what happened. The home office in Jerusalem, mostly all Jewish Christians, got wind of what was going on in Antioch. And they dispatch a couple of Jedis out there to find out what's going on. Hey, somebody go sort out this apparently woke church up in Antioch. And these Jews from Jerusalem come in. And as soon as they show up, people start getting real intimidated. In fact, some of the Jews who were already in Antioch start to pull back from fellowship with the Gentile believers. Even Peter and Barnabas did that. They were the leaders there. But thank God for the Apostle Paul. Paul will not put up with this. And in Galatians 2, uh, we, we read what Paul did when he came there. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, you know, the, the leader of Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Well, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, basically, what's the matter with you, boy? What is going on here? There's a gospel of reconciling love. You're going to deny that thing now? I mean, th that's how adamant, you know, he was about it. And, and that's why for us, you know, there is like one inviolable standard here at Willowdale Chapel. And that is a loving, gracious embrace of everybody who names the name of Jesus here. We will not put up with divisions where Christ has already united us in beloved community. And that loving, warm, welcoming embrace that we have for everyone here, it actually, by extension, is the same thing we offer to the world. Let's go out one last layer to how the cross unites us, I'll say, for the world. And I'm drawing this up from the end of the passage where we're described as a temple, you know, the temple of God. You know, we're, we're this people who are, we're near to God now, all of us together. We're, we're near to God. In fact, we're in God and God is in us. And, you know, if you're an insider in that, that's a wonderful thing. You want to enjoy that together, but it's not just for you. The temple was a place where the whole world was invited to gather. The temple was a place where what maybe people in later spirituality would call a thin place. The temple was supposed to be a thin place where the margin and separation between heaven and earth got real thin, kind of translucent and permeable. Temple was the place where the spirit touched the flesh, where grace touched need, where wisdom from above came and touched our confused realities, where God's glory sometimes was actually visible and perceptible, and people could draw near and begin to rethink their own lives in light of God's glory and grace. That's what the temple was for. And in Ephesians 2, we're called that temple, that place, that thin place between heaven and earth, that nexus of heaven and earth. It's here. It's in us. It's amongst us. And the whole world is welcome into it. In fact, our unity together as a body will really be determinative of whether or not the world will ever embrace it as well and find life and hope in Jesus. Christ himself said that. In fact, he prayed it for us in John 17, his famous high priestly prayer that he prayed for the church right before he went to the cross. That prayer says, among many other things, this. Jesus says to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Long and short of this, Jesus says, the world's going to believe in me 
if they see reconciling love in you, if they see the peace of the gospel in you, we're that place. And that's why I arranged these points, by the way, in concentric squares. Because that's what the original stone temple in Jerusalem was. It was concentric squares. There were layers of access. Gentiles and Jews and priests and the high priest. And there were strict barriers between all those places. And frightening warnings. Like if anybody goes behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, dead. The only one who goes in there is the high priest and once a year. There were signs up between the courts of the Gentiles and the court of the Jews that said any Gentile crossing this threshold will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Welcome to church. Come too close, we're killing you. <laughs> Jesus came and destroyed all that. He destroyed all that. He started on the first day of Holy Week when he went into the very outer courts of the temple and he made a whip and he flipped over the money changers tables and he drove out the animals and he said, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. You're making it like a den of thieves. He got rid of that outer layer. And our passage in Ephesians 2 says when he went to the cross, he destroyed the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. There's no more division kind of in the center ring there. And when he died, the moment he died, you know what happened to the temple veil, the thing that marked off the holiest place. It was torn from top to bottom. So now everybody had access to the throne room of God. All of us could come and lay hold of God and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's why we don't need a stone temple anymore because we've got temple, a temple of flesh and blood right here. This is who we are. This is who we're called to be. That's why I wanted to bring these names into the room today. Oh, if God would open hearts you know, to believe the gospel, if people would start to find community and growth and, and, and that thin place between heaven and earth here amongst us, how awesome would that be? I hope you'll pray hard for these people every day, especially this week. This week could be the time where their eternal destiny changes. And how awesome would it be if we filled a few more seats on the rescue boat with those who are being saved? Well, before we close our service, uh, we have a story to share with you. Um, and uh, it's from Wendy Thorngate. Talk about rethinking some things in your life. Wendy's been doing that for the last couple of years. And uh, take a listen to what she has to share. So one of the, the things that God gave me again as a gift as I've been going through this was uh, a, a message of roll up your sleeves, we're just getting started. I've been a Christian for, for all of my adult life, kind of as a young person, but it was, it was part of my life. It wasn't the lens through which I viewed everything. And that's one of the changes that God has really worked in me. I'm Wendy Thorngate. Been going to Willowdale probably about five or six years. And the last couple of years in particular has been a real journey for me. One of the ways that kind of made sense in my head uh, is that God has been helping create this beautiful garden in my life. But to do that, he had to make a lot of changes. He had to take a lot of things that maybe I was leaning into that I thought were pretty good. I had a few weeds, but that he, he had something much better planned for me that I didn't know at the time. The real journey probably started with a cancer diagnosis of stage three colon cancer. And I'm usually pretty stubborn, so I know before that God has used kind of a two by four to get my attention in life, but apparently he really wanted my attention this time. So that was um, what God used to take away a lot of the things that I was maybe clinging to, my identity at work, that I needed to always get that acknowledgement um, and that identity kind of from outside of me. The cancer, the surgery, and then the chemotherapy actually ended up being an eight month disability uh, full time from work that I couldn't work at all. So all the things that I had 
kind of gotten my identity from and my sense of accomplishment um, were just taken away. And my body really didn't like chemotherapy, so I was flat on my back for a lot of it. But I don't know that the transformation really happened there. That was really where God just cleared the soil. So he just took all of the, the priorities that I thought I had, all the things that I thought I needed to do, and taught me to just slow down and, and really to rest in him. What came after that, I think was only possible because I had gone through this journey, because he had done all of the, the uprooting Recovered from the chemotherapy, I started going back to work part-time, and life was good. I was kind of getting into a new normal, but things were very different. And I noticed at work, I had very different responsibilities when I came back. And God gave me a sense of peace that this was all part of His plan, that this is what, what He needed me to go through to, to learn things. That really led into the summer of 2020 which for me was kind of the start of some real changes inside. It started with me really watching my husband's reaction to the video of the killing of George Floyd and just watching that, that atrocity and how people uh, maybe reacted to that. And I didn't know what to do, so I just really called every black friend, church member, and coworker that, that I knew and didn't know what to say, but just wanted to let them know that I cared about them. And what I found was there was a depth of pain that I had never, um, never seen before. And even though I had probably asked each of these people a hundred times, hey, how are you doing? I was never a safe space for them to share that pain. And it was really humbling. And I realized that I, I needed to learn a lot. Greg Lafferty had put out recommendations for books and readings, and one of them was The Repentance Project, which I didn't like the name, to be honest. I knew there was a biblical concept of corporate repentance, but it wasn't something that I felt that I personally had done anything wrong. But I thought, all right, well, let me maybe work through this. And it talked about lament, which was another biblical concept I didn't really understand. But I knew how to read and I knew how to learn. I always liked learning. And so I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll learn this. And learned a lot about the history in our country and and a lot of things that were very difficult to read. But one of the things that I really needed to learn is to, to just sit with the pain. I'm kind of a person that as soon as I see something, I'm like, all right, I wanna fix it. Even when I reached out to my friends on the, the, the pain that they were feeling with racial reconciliation, I immediately said, well, what can I do? I can, I can do something. And what I learned was that, you know, there may be a time for that, but first I needed to, to really understand the pain and just sit with that. And that was part of God turning the soil in my life. The most difficult thing for me was that I, I wanted to process what I was learning. I wanted to share that with family and friends, just trying to, to figure out, you know, talk to them about what I was learning. And what I was just shocked at is these, they didn't want any parts of these conversations. Um, it made them very uncomfortable. They walked out of the room on me, they hung up the phone, they walked out of the car on me. These were good Christian people, people that I loved, but they didn't want to walk that journey with me. There, there was, these were very uncomfortable conversations for them. But God is good, and so he brought some of the women that I had been in a Bible study with who also cared about the topic and were just trying to learn and process together and let me know, you know, I wasn't crazy. They were trying to process the same things. I continued to talk with more women about racial reconciliation. Through work, there were a number of different courses that they were offering and I could learn about different topics. It led into a season of just real spiritual transformation. So in 2021, from January to maybe March or April, God just brought so many things together. I was doing a Bible study called Discerning the Voice of God with Priscilla Shire, which was amazing. And I did my first uh, devotional. I'd never done that before. At one point, I kind of felt like a, a ball of dough that God was just kneading because I could feel everything inside that he was just taking away pride, teaching me humility, teaching me empathy, teaching me when to be quiet, to really listen, leaning into scripture, starting to develop new habits of prayer that I really hadn't done before. I could just feel the changes inside. 
Along this journey, one of the most amazing things to me is that God has continued to bring other people, and, and particularly women, into my life who've cared about this topic and that we're learning together. I never led a Bible study before. I've done some leadership at work and things like that. Um, this was very different, and this was certainly not a topic that I was coming from as a place of, of being the expert in any way, shape, or form. This was about learning together. We were learning about the topic of race in, in the church in America. And God gave me beautiful women in this group that he has pulled together, a very diverse group, different perspectives. They're such wonderful, caring women that have just surrounded me and supported me as we work through some really challenging topics. You know, none of us had the answers, um, but trying to learn from one another and just really seeking God's will on this and how do we, how do we deal with this topic in a way that, that God would want us to? How do we see the image of God in other people, which is, I don't think, something we're very good at sometimes. So I'm two and a half years into remission from cancer, just praying that God continues to give me the strength to stay on that journey that I'm on. I don't know what He has in store, um, but it's, it's going to just be absolutely amazing and many, many more years to enjoy it. So I'm excited. <laughs>